In these highly polarized times, bipartisan cooperation in Congress is rare, except for when it comes to this one thing. We have a bond to Israel that's much stronger. It's a moral commitment because it is a democracy, the only democracy in that area. And under the circumstances, that is why American presidents and the American people in the future will support all out the survival of Israel. For nearly eight decades, the American public, politicians, and president have all remained largely unified in backing Israel. But even as public support has split sharply in recent months over concerns about its ceaseless assaults on Gaza, the U.S. government's position hasn't budged. To the contrary, Congress has been quick to condemn and even censure members who've dared to stray from the standard script. Israel has a right to defend itself. Israel is our greatest ally in the Middle East. Criticizing the Jewish state is anti-Semitic. So I wanted to find out, how did these talking points get so firmly cemented in the first place? What do our politicians stand to lose for going off message? And what does the U.S. stand to gain by maintaining its bipartisan, lockstep support for the tiny country with enormous baggage? This is why Congress is obsessed with Israel. Roll the intro. From Jerusalem, the city of prophecy and universal inspiration, I bring you the traditional Hebrew greeting, Shalom. We set up the Israeli government in Palestine, moved some of the Arabs out. They've done things over there that never have been done in that part of the world before. Thank you to my partner on today's video, PDS Debt. Credit card debt sucks. I have talked about this before, but I've been buried under more credit card debt than I care to admit. And now it feels like everything is costing more these days from cereal to cell phones. And many people are at the point where they're buying the same stuff they always do, but have to put some of it on credit cards just to get by. And that can add up really easily. And those debts can really weigh on you and feel like you will never get out from under them. PDS Debt can help. PDS Debt has customized options for anyone struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or medical bills. They offer multiple programs and solutions tailored to your specific needs, budget, and financial goals, and they have a team of people ready to help you with your debt journey. PDS Debt is offering a free debt analysis. It only takes 30 seconds. Head over to pdsdebt.com Miller to get your free debt assessment today. You'll receive a full breakdown on how to save on interest each month and the quickest way to take care of your debt. Everyone with over $10,000 in debt qualifies, and there's no minimum credit score required. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low monthly payment so you can can save thousands in interest and fees. If you're making payments every month on your debt, but your balances just won't seem to go down, this program is for you. PDS Debt is a top rated company on Google and has an A plus rating on the BBB. So to take advantage of PDS Debt's free debt analysis, just for my viewers, go to pdsdebt.com Miller to complete the quick and easy debt assessment in just 30 seconds. That's pdsdebt.com Miller. Thanks, PDS Debt. For generations, the U.S. has been Israel's most powerful and steadfast ally. And though this latest war with Hamas isn't the first time our government has faced public pushback regarding Israel's tactics, the recent outcry has successfully forced the administration to work a little harder at appearing to give a shit about humanitarian concerns. In 2023, the U.S. transferred $80.9 billion of military aid to its allies and partners, the highest annual total ever, marking a nearly 50 56% increase from the previous year. Meanwhile, neither the State Department nor the Department of Defense has ever trained or assigned personnel to monitor how its arms transfers are used. This lack of oversight, combined with mounting concerns about the death toll in Gaza, led Democrats in Congress to push for more accountability. So back in February, President Biden issued National Security Memorandum 20, barring any recipient of U.S. military aid from restricting the delivery of humanitarian aid. It also gave the State Department a May 8th deadline to report to Congress on credible and reliable written assurances that each country receiving U.S. military aid for an act of conflict is using those supplies in compliance with international humanitarian law. On May 3rd, five days before that report was due, Colorado Representative Jason Crow led a cohort of 86 Democratic lawmakers who signed a letter to Biden claiming that despite Israel's claims, it has indeed violated international law and obstructed U.S. aid deliveries to Gaza. On May 7th, it was announced that 
the administration would not make its deadline, partly over concerns that Israel's assurances of compliance couldn't be trusted. The same week, the White House paused a shipment of 3,500 bombs to Israel, fearing they'd be used against the more than 1 million civilians sheltering in Rafah, the last major Hamas stronghold in Gaza. If they go into Rafah, Biden said, I'm not supplying the arms. Though holding back that shipment caused Republicans in Congress to accuse Biden of abandoning Israel in its time of need, little has tangibly changed. The pause had no impact on a foreign aid bill signed in April that included $15 billion in Israeli military aid, as well as $9 billion in humanitarian aid for Gaza. So to be clear, we gave the Israeli military $15 billion to continue its offensive against Gaza, and then $9 billion in humanitarian aid so Gaza can attempt to recover from the bombardments and attacks that we're also funding. Perfect. Conscience cleansed. On May 10th, Secretary of State Antony Blinken submitted the overdue NSM 20 report, which despite acknowledging numerous credible claims to the contrary, concluded that Israel had not obstructed humanitarian assistance to Gaza. Career State Department official Stacey Gilbert resigned in protest just a few weeks later. Gilbert joined a handful of other staffers who've resigned since the war began last October, including Hala Rarit, an Arabic language spokesperson who told the Washington Post that she resigned after it became clear that internal discussion about U.S.-Israel policy was unwelcome, unlike almost every other subject during her 18-year career at the State Department. I lay all this out to demonstrate that people are speaking up against Israel's brutality at various levels of our government. Yet, no matter what happens, it seems like the U.S.'s allegiance to Israel can't be shaken. To find out why, I think it's worth going way back to the very beginning to see what motivated our alliance in the first place and find out how the relationship has evolved. Turns out, the U.S. has sided with Israel since day one. Palestine was a British colony from 1917 to 1948, and during that time, the U.S. wasn't really involved. In 1947, we were part of the U.N. General Assembly vote approving the 1947 Partition Plan, in which 56% of Palestine would be awarded to the Jewish residents of Palestine, who made up 30% of the population, and the 70% of the population that was Arab would get squished into 44% of their own homeland. The proposal was rejected by surrounding Arab states and the Palestinians, and fighting broke out. On May 14th, 1948, the day British rule in Palestine was scheduled to end, Israel declared itself an independent state, kicking off the Arab-Israeli war. 11 minutes after Israel announced its statehood, President Harry Truman issued a statement making the U.S. the first nation to recognize Israel's independence. Now, why was the U.S. so eager to jump into bed with a tiny new nation already embroiled in conflict? According to former U.S. ambassador to Israel, Samuel Lewis, there were six main reasons for Truman's declaration in in 1948. One, re-election. Truman was up for re-election and knew he couldn't afford to lose the Jewish vote. Many American Jews were lobbying for a Jewish state at the time, and after making his decisive move of support for Israel, Truman secured 75% of the Jewish vote and ultimately won re-election. Though it's worth noting that Jewish people account for about 2% of the U.S. population, so let's not get any conspiratorial ideas about Jews controlling election outcomes, okay? Number two, guilt. In 1924, the U.S. passed a new immigration policy called the Johnson-Reed Act, which established new literacy tests and quotas to curtail European emigration and preserve the ideal of U.S. homogeneity. The result was that U.S. borders were almost entirely sealed off to the European Jews who were later murdered in the Holocaust. In 1948, that guilt was powerful. Three, humanitarianism. Jewish people who had survived the Holocaust clearly needed somewhere to go, and it's not like we wanted them to live here. Four, Judeo-Christian enthusiasm. Anytime there's a biblical excuse to do something, a lot of folks will get excited. The Bible says that the Israelites are supposed to inherit that land. This angle shouldn't be underestimated. Today, evangelical Christians are more uncritically supportive of Israel than Jewish people are. Five, ignorance. American politicians simply didn't understand the complex history of the region and how devastating the creation of Israel would be. Oops. Six, idealism. Americans love an underdog story. And something about the Jewish people fighting for their independence really appealed to Truman's personal sense of justice. And as a culture, we've held tightly to this narrative ever since. And if you're like, wait, Lee, what about the most obvious reason we stick by Israel, the strategic advantage that comes with having a close ally in the Middle East? Amazingly, strategy didn't become an official cornerstone of our relationship with Israel until the 80s. Still, our bond definitely strengthened throughout the intervening years. As the Cold War heated up and the USSR solidified its hold over more of the Middle East, President Kennedy sent Israel U.S. Hawk anti-aircraft missiles in 1963, along with assurances of military support in the event of an Arab invasion. In exchange, 
Kennedy was able to negotiate some concessions regarding Israel's burgeoning nuclear research center, which we were obviously really keen to keep a close eye on. Where Kennedy had unlocked the door, Lyndon B. Johnson kicked it down. LBJ was already a major fan of Israel, having supported every aid package and voting against any sanctions during his time as a senator and majority leader. As the USSR steadily increased military aid to Egypt and Syria, Israel became an essential bulwark against Soviet encroachment, as well as a vital tool for securing oil. So to help maintain the regional balance of power, Johnson ignored CIA recommendations and sold Israel more than 200 M48 tanks, plus A4 Skyhawk and F4 Phantom planes. He also never pressured Israel to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. This was the birth of the US's commitment to what's known as Israel's Qualitative Military Edge, or QME, meaning the technological, tactical, and other advantages that allow Israel to deter numerically superior adversaries. But that doesn't mean Johnson approved every request Israel made. In 1967, when Egypt blockaded the port of Eilat, Israel called up the US like, hey guys, we're in big trouble. If you don't send us some more weapons, we're definitely getting our asses kicked. But the American intelligence community quickly did the math and concluded that actually, Israel was positioned to defeat any combination of its neighbors within 10 days. Since the Vietnam War was already underway and causing quite enough of an international relations headache for the administration, LBJ rebuffed Israel's request. And as it turned out, they did not need our help. On June 5th, 1967, Israeli warplanes set out to launch a preemptive strike on Egypt's air fleet. In less than 35 minutes, Israel reached its destination. Within minutes, more than 400 Egyptian combat planes were destroyed. 75% of the largest air armada in the Middle East was gone. In the week that followed, Israel launched a three-front campaign against enemy forces triple its size. By the end of the Six-Day War, Israel captured territory including the Sinai Peninsula, Gaza Strip, West Bank, Golan Heights, and Old City of Jerusalem. Broadly speaking, Americans were impressed. David had defeated Goliath in a moral fight for independence. At least that's how our press reported it. Evangelical Christian Americans were particularly excited about this win. They'd always been down with Israel because, like I said, since in the Bible, God promised land to Abraham, that's basically a real estate contract. Evangelicals were also stoked to regain access to Old Jerusalem, where worship had previously been heavily restricted. A Washington Post journalist challenged the religious awe that many felt about the Six-Day War. Working as quickly as the Lord of Genesis, Israel recreated the Middle East in six days. To this day, evangelical support for Israel remains strong. But let's not pretend this is all about religion. According to political scientist Steven Spiegel, Richard Nixon was the first president to see Israel as a strategic asset. In 1971, he increased military aid from less than $100 million annually to more than $300 million per year. The next major flashpoint in our relationship with Israel came two years later in 1970. Egypt and Syria, both backed by the USSR, teamed up against Israel in an attempt to recapture land they'd lost in the Six-Day War. This time, Israel was genuinely in deep shit. So President Nixon jumped into action, telling Henry Kissinger to send everything that will fly. What followed was the largest airlift in American history, followed by Israeli victory three weeks later. By the end of the war, nearly 53,500 people had died, the most casualties from any military confrontation between Israel and its neighbors up to that point. In the aftermath of the fighting, the U.S. played a central role in negotiating peace agreements, hoping to stabilize the region and prevent the need for U.S. intervention in the event of another serious military conflict. In 1978, President Jimmy Carter brought the Israeli Prime Minister and the Egyptian President to Camp David to broker a peace agreement. The Camp David Accords laid the groundwork for the Egypt-Israel Peace Treaty of 1979, the first of its kind between Israel and any of its Arab neighbors. That same year, Carter's United Nations and Ambassador Andrew Young was forced to resign after it became known that he had concealed a meeting with a representative of the Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO. Young was too hip for the room, frankly, and according to the Washington Post, in just five months on the job, Young had become a controversial figure for his off-the-cuff comments about how Cuban troops were a stabilizing force in Angola, and how the British, the Russians, the Swedes, and the people of the New York City borough of Queens were racist. He was summoned by the president after telling Playboy magazine that Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford were, in fact, 
racists. Young wasn't the only American to voice doubts about Israel, but he was one of relatively few. In 1978, South Dakota Senator James Aberesk, the first Arab American to serve in the Senate, authored a penthouse article called The Relentless Israeli Propaganda Machine. It's worth noting that Aberesk wasn't bound by fears of political retaliation at that point. When writing the article, he'd already decided not to run for re-election, saying, nothing ever really changes. It's the system itself. Anyway, then Senator Aberesk wrote scathingly of the culture of complicity already surrounding Israel in US Congress. The worst kind of intellectual terrorism is reserved for the politicians who dare to question Israel on its policy. Israel has so wrapped itself in its state religion, Judaism, that any criticism of its politics is immediately branded as criticism of its religion. Thus, the critic is accused of anti-Semitism, a charge that has served to silence even the mildest questioning of Israel's policies. A senator was complaining about this in 1978. However, during the Reagan administration, official rhetoric shifted away from moral reasons to support Israel and towards more strategic ones, because morally, things were getting pretty questionable. During the Reagan years, a series of policy moves tied U.S. defense structures much more closely with Israel than ever before, at least in part motivated by a desire to exert more influence over Israel to help keep it in line. Twice in 1981, Reagan voted to sanction Israel and postpone arms shipments due to Israel-led hostilities in the region. To rein Israel in from further actions that could disrupt regional stability, in November 1981, Israel and the U.S. formalized our strategic relationship with the Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU. It established joint military exercises, cooperation on joint readiness campaigns, and the establishment of a joint supervisory council. Just days later, Israel extended its jurisdiction into the occupied Golan Heights, causing the U.S. to pause the MOU until 1983. Reagan's biggest flip-flop on Israel came in 1982, when Israel invaded Lebanon, leading Reagan to halt a third arms shipment, citing concern that the ammunition would be used against civilians. Sounds familiar. According to Richard Murphy, Reagan's ambassador to Saudi Arabia, the the president was deeply disturbed by the images he saw from the ground in Beirut. He made it very plain that he wanted this to come to a stop when the human side was pushed in his face. But the face of the human side would soon change when in 1983, 241 U.S. Marines were killed in Beirut by local protesters. Six days after the Marines were attacked, President Reagan signed National Security Decision Directive 111, reinstating strategic collaboration with Israel. Soon, Israel and the U.S. had established a new formal joint political military group that has convened every six months since to collaborate on planning and training efforts. In 1985, Israel was facing high inflation, large government budget deficits, and slow growth. To help stabilize and reinvigorate Israel's economy, the U.S. and its BFF created the Joint Economic Development Group, which meets annually to this day to discuss economic policy. By the mid-1980s, lobbyists no longer needed to push Congress hard to side with Israel. According to international relations expert Helena Cobbin, many members of of Congress had long been used to applying different standards to actions undertaken by Israel than those undertaken by any other government, including their own, across a wide range of issues. In 1987, tensions between Israelis and Palestinians boiled over into what's now known as the First Antifada, which lasted until 1993. All told, several hundred Israelis and nearly 2,000 Palestinians were killed before the Oslo Accords were signed and the fighting paused. The Palestinian Liberation Organization, or PLO, recognized Israel's right to exist. Israel recognized the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people, and Israeli troops agreed to withdraw in stages from the West Bank and Gaza. In 1994, the U.S. successfully brokered a peace treaty between Israel and Jordan, and the following year, the Oslo II Accords established Palestinian self-government in Gaza and 40% of the West Bank. And for a brief, shining moment leading up to the new millennium, it looked like the U.S. might actually be able to pull off playing peacemaker in one of the most contested regions on Earth. But Y2K had other plans. Thank you to my Patreon community and my YouTube members for supporting the research and work that goes into these videos. I love making these videos free and widely available for as many people as possible because I believe strongly in access to legal and political education. And your contributions on Patreon or YouTube membership allow me to continue bringing you this content for free week after week. To say thank you, as a member on Patreon or YouTube, you'll receive early, uncensored, ad-free versions of these videos, as well as special extra content and more. So so please consider joining today.
The year is 2000, and President Bill Clinton has summoned Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak and PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat to Camp David to discuss borders, settlements, refugees, and Jerusalem. But the negotiations fall apart, and mistrust on both sides soon sparks a second antifada. It lasts until 2005, when Israel agrees to fully withdraw from Gaza. But while the antifada rages, President George W. Bush doesn't have a ton of bandwidth to spare. Early in his presidency, baby Bush seemed eager to distance his administration from the Israeli-Arab conflict as much as possible, while remaining friendly with Israel. After 9-11, he began pursuing a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, hoping to build Muslim support for his war against the Taliban in Afghanistan. By 2003, a U.S. policy had developed calling for the democratization of the Arab world as a means of preventing terrorism. It was basically a recycled version of our Cold War stance towards communism. If you bring them democracy, terrorism won't happen. Easy. When Obama came to power, he continued to emphasize peace, but was eager to set his foreign policy apart from President Bush's. Obama believed that reaching out to former enemies like China, North Korea, Venezuela, Russia, Cuba, etc., and meeting them halfway was the best path to compromise. He gave particular focus to warming up relations with the Muslim world, making trips to Egypt, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia without visiting Israel. In 2010, after right-leaning Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was re-elected, Vice President Biden did go to Israel, but it ended badly, with Biden publicly condemning Israel's plans to build thousands of new Jewish settlements in contested territory. Gradually, Obama came to embrace the idea that he couldn't force peace if he wanted it more than both negotiating parties. Still, the vibe between Obama and Netanyahu remained frosty at best. This led 300 U.S. Congress people to send a letter urging then-Secretary of State Hillary Clinton to stop squabbling with Israel and get back on the same page. They wrote, Our view is that such differences are best resolved quietly, in trust and confidence, as befits long-standing strategic allies. 300 members of Congress saw the Obama administration getting the tiniest bit feisty with Israel and banded together across the aisle to remind the administration to toe the line. In 2011, Obama became the first American president to formally support a two-state solution based on the borders in place before the Six-Day War in 1967. In response to that declaration, Senator Mitt Romney said Obama had thrown Israel under the bus. Hamas and Netanyahu also rejected the suggestion. To help smooth things over, in 2016, Obama signed a new Memorandum of Understanding, providing Israel with $38 billion in U.S. military support over the next decade, reiterating our steadfast commitment to the security of the state of Israel. Experts at the foreign policy think tank the Washington Institute say the agreement was also a message to Israel's adversaries that Washington's support for its ally remains uniquely deep, despite recent policy disagreements. In practice, that looks like $3.3 billion a year in foreign military financing and another $500 million for programs for the Israeli mobile all-weather air defense system called the Iron Dome. There aren't many strings attached regarding what weapons can be purchased or how those weapons can be used against civilians, for example. The only real catch is that most of that aid, 74% of it, must be spent in the U.S. So our government basically gives Israel coupons to buy American-made military equipment. Cool. Trump, of course, quickly established himself as one of our most pro-Israel presidents to date. In December 2017, the U.S. became the first nation to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital, even though Jerusalem is one of the most hotly contested sticking points in peace negotiations. In 2018, Trump's administration slashed aid to the Palestinians and the UNRWA, the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees. As the PLO office in Washington, D.C. closed, the U.S. opened an embassy in Jerusalem. In 2019, Trump recognized recognized the Golan Heights as part of Israel for the first time since the land was captured by Israel in 1967. And in 2020, Trump's administration brokered a series of deals to normalize relations between Israel and several Arab states, including the UAE and Morocco. Once Biden came in, he initially focused on encouraging more nations to reach normalization agreements with Israel, which critics say is a betrayal of the Palestinian cause, while condemning moves by Israel that could threaten a two-state solution, like expanding its West Bank settlements, for example. In 2021, the Biden administration administration successfully brokered a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas after fighting broke out over clashes at the Al-Aqsa Mosque and evictions of Palestinians in East Jerusalem. In 2022, violence spiked again between the two sides, and Israel launched counterterrorism operations in the West Bank. The largest of these operations kicked off in July 2023. And in response, Biden reiterated the U.S. mantra of supporting Israel's right to defend itself, this despite a somewhat fraught relationship between Biden and Netanyahu over the years. According to old Joe, he won 
months, years ago, signed a picture that later sat on a young Netanyahu's desk that read, Bibi, I love you, but I don't agree with a damn thing you have to say. Again, this collegial, intimate, even familial language reiterates the impression that the ties binding the US and Israel are deeper and stronger than any political actor alone could shake. Shortly after the October 7th attack that saw Hamas terrorists murder more than a thousand Israelis, Biden flew to Israel and hugged Netanyahu on the tarmac in Tel Aviv. It's been more than seven months since Hamas's initial attack on Israel, and more than 36,000 Palestinians have died with no end in sight, even as Israel has been accused of genocide and other war crimes by the International Court of Justice. Polling from May 2024 shows that 70% of US voters support a permanent ceasefire, 83% of Democrats, 65% of independents, and 56% of Republicans. That's a nine point increase from support for a ceasefire since November 2023. This rift has caused immense strain for President Biden, who would really like to win a second term this November, but whose actions towards Israel have alienated vast swaths of voters, including a large population of Arab American voters, especially in Michigan, a state Trump won by just over 10,000 votes in 2016. Republicans see Biden pausing that singular arms shipment as a betrayal of Israel. In contrast, Democrats see Biden's refusal to pause any additional arms shipments as a betrayal of the Palestinian people. Well, some Democrats, though a handful of progressive members of Congress have have spoken up against Israel's crimes, their critiques haven't been received warmly, to say the least. In November 2023, Michigan representative and the only Palestinian American member of Congress, Rashida Tlaib, became the 26th House member in history to receive an official censure. Hers was for promoting false narratives regarding the October 7th, 2023 Hamas attack on Israel and for calling for the destruction of the state of Israel. Censure is the step before expulsion, though it's far less consequential. A censure mostly amounts to a black stain on someone's permanent record. Or a a badge of honor, depending on who you ask. The House voted 234 to 188 to censure to leave. 22 of the yay votes came from fellow Democrats. Of particular concern was the representative's use of the controversial phrase, from the river to the sea. According to the Anti-Defamation League, the rallying cry is fundamentally anti-Semitic, calling for a Palestinian state extending from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, territory that includes the state of Israel, which would mean the dismantling of the Jewish state. But many of the people invoking the phrase argue that from the river to the sea is simply a call for peace and equality for the Palestinian people. But look, some of the people shouting from the river to the sea do mean it in the first way as a call to eradicate Jewish people. And it's hard to tell which camp somebody is in at first blush while, for instance, strolling past a campus protest. So some sensitivity around the phrase is understandable, but for sensitivity to so quickly escalate to official censure is yet another sign that the playing field isn't even. Claims of anti-Semitism, among other tactics, have helped keep Americans both in and outside Congress blindly loyal to Israel for generations generations. From the start, a handful of tactics have had an outsized impact on U.S.-Israeli relations. As we've already discussed, both in this video and my video on student protests, conflating criticism of the Jewish state with anti-Semitism shuts down even the potential for meaningful conversation about Israeli policy. In 2019, Minnesota Representative Ilhan Omar was the subject of a House resolution condemning a series of allegedly anti-Semitic comments she had made since 2012. The main focus was something Representative Omar said during a town hall meeting in 2019. She said, I want to talk about the political influence in this country that says it is okay to push for the allegiance to a foreign country. Critics said the comment played on anti-Semitic stereotypes, including the pernicious myth of dual loyalty and foreign allegiance. And we talked about that in my George Soros video, which you can check out after this. California Republican Representative Juan Vargas responded to Omar's comment saying that questioning support for the US-Israel relationship is unacceptable. Trump said she should resign, which she didn't. Omar was removed from the House Foreign Affairs Committee, but the resolution condemning her never passed. Of the resolutions, four points, three were about anti-Semitism, but the fourth went wider, invoking the transcendent principles of tolerance, religious freedom, and equal protection as embodied in the Declaration of Independence and the First and Fourteenth Amendments to the Constitution. This is fascinating considering that the Jewish state has methodically disenfranchised large portions of its Muslim population to maintain Jewish authority. Also weird to see the First Amendment invoked while censoring a congresswoman's speech. The U.S. has long seen Israel as our 
ideological brother in the Middle East. And boy howdy do we love any excuse to meddle in the Middle East. Israel belongs to many of the same clubs we do. The UN, OECD, IMF, World Bank, WTO, etc. And in addition to cooperating closely on military things, we've established numerous scientific and cultural exchange programs, including the Binational Science Foundation, the Binational Agricultural Research and Development Foundation, the Binational Industrial Research and Development Foundation, and the U.S.-Israeli Education Foundation. But all this coordination and cooperation isn't out of the goodness of anyone's heart. We make a ton of money off one another. Remember that 74% of the billions of dollars in military aid we give Israel is basically just coupons for U.S. equipment and services. We're Israel's number one trading partner. Our commercial and economic collaborations span sectors, including IT, biotech, the life sciences, healthcare, energy, pharmaceuticals, food and beverage, defense industries, cybersecurity, aviation, and more. According to the U.S. Embassy in Israel, critical components of leading American high-tech products are invented and designed in Israel, making these American companies more competitive and more profitable globally. Cisco, Intel, Motorola, Applied Materials, and HP are just a few examples. On top of that, U.S. companies established two-thirds of the more than 300 foreign-invested R&D centers in Israel, helping transform it into a so-called startup nation of advanced tech. In my video about student protests, we talked about how much more difficult it would be for American universities to divest from Israel today than it was to divest from South Africa in the 80s. And this is why. Our economies are incredibly entangled. As a Judeo-Christian nation, Israel already had a massive leg up on its neighbors when it came to relating to Americans. But beyond religion, race also became a point of connection. The role of white supremacy in upholding U.S.-Israel relations has long been noted by pro-Palestinian voices. While Islamophobia lays the groundwork for the dehumanization of Palestinians, the precarious notion of Jewish whiteness further complicates the dynamic. On the one hand, Jewish Americans have been legally considered free white persons since the Naturalization Act of 1790. And today, 94% of Jewish Americans identify as white. On the other hand, European Jews were intentionally excluded in later immigration policy while they were being systematically exterminated. As Eric Goldstein, associate professor of history at Emory University, explained in The Atlantic, Jewish identity in America is inherently paradoxical and contradictory. What you have is a group that was historically considered and considered itself an outsider group, a persecuted minority. In the space of two generations, they've become one of the most successful integrated groups in American society, by many accounts part of the establishment. And there's a lot of dissonance between those two positions. So the question of whiteness in America is less about skin tone than it is about power. The status of Jewish whiteness could be interpreted as a measure of safety. Outsiders tend to see the prominent place of Jewish people in America and believe their power is entrenched, is certain. However, that status feels less certain within a community whose history has been defined by a long series of expulsions and rejections. I bring this up because how much power Jewish people are perceived to have versus how much they feel like they have 100% shapes our conversations about Israel. I'm not saying this to defend white identifying Jewish people who refuse to interrogate their contributions to upholding white supremacy. I'm just pointing out that this fundamental difference in perception makes this issue even harder to talk about. And what we can't talk about, we can't hope to understand, which brings us to Propaganda. In his 1978 Penthouse article, Senator James Averesk wrote that it has been fashionable from the beginning to write stories favorable to Israel and unfavorable to the Arabs. Israel was depicted at the outset as an underdog, and Americans will by nature side with that particular role. Thus, the optic through which Americans view the Middle Eastern struggle is almost exclusively Israeli. That overly one-sided point of view would not be possible without the generous help of the American media revising the struggle to make Israeli aggression appear to be self-defense. Aberesk offers numerous examples of the American press's asymmetric reporting throughout the 60s and 70s, highlighting one particularly egregious instance in 1977 when the Washington Post reported on secret CIA payments to King Hussein of Jordan. The story led the news for the next week, yet hardly anyone followed up to mention that the $10 million Jordan had received over 20 years was only one-eighth of the amount the CIA gave Israel over the same period. When asked about the omission, the 
The Washington Post admitted that it knew about the payments to Israel, but didn't think they were worth mentioning because they seemed to be under different circumstances. Aberest goes on to accuse the majority of the U.S. press for blacking out reports of torture, beatings, wrongful imprisonment, forced relocation, and deportation of Arabs in occupied territories. Today, social media has disrupted traditional information channels, giving Americans far more access to on-the-ground information than ever before. Yet, as pushback from U.S. officials and press pundits to the student protests sweeping the nation have revealed, it's still not popular or safe to criticize Israel. And when public opinion begins to waver, pro-Israel lobbyists are ready to fight for the status quo. Numerous organizations advocate for U.S. support of Israel. The largest and most politically powerful is the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, AIPAC. Its members wield influence through grassroots organizing, advocacy, and fundraising, primarily among American Jews and Christian evangelical churches. Founded in 1954, today, AIPAC claims to have more than 3 million members. Its popular annual conference in Washington, D.C. typically boasts around 20,000 attendees, plus appearances from top U.S. politicians, including Biden and Trump. In 2021, AIPAC formed a PAC to funnel its money directly to candidates for the first time. According to Open Secrets, AIPAC and its affiliated PACs poured nearly $50 million into political contributions and independent expenditures during the 2022 election cycle. Predictions for spending during 2024 start at $100 million. One of AIPAC's strengths is that it's a single-issue lobbying group. They fund politicians on both sides of the aisle. Getting on AIPAC's good side and getting their funding is as simple as promising to be a true friend of the Jewish state. As you might imagine, they've been busy lately, strategically identifying candidates to run against any member of Congress who's called for a ceasefire and or an end to USA to Israel. Though AIPAC supports both Democrats and Republicans, its current targets are all Democrats, specifically a group of 19 liberals in the House known as the Squad. AIPAC has already found challengers to take on representatives Ilhan Omar of Minnesota, Summer Lee of Pennsylvania, Cory Bush of Missouri, and Jamal Bowman of New York. In the last quarter of 2023, AIPAC gave Bowman's opponent in the Democratic primary, George Latimer, more than $600,000, more than 40% of his total campaign contributions. But Bowman's outspokenness wasn't entirely a liability. In the same quarter, he raised over $730,000, mostly from Arab and Muslim grassroots organizations and individual donors. For comparison, Bowman barely raised $200,000 in 2021. But no one has fared quite as well as Representative Rashida Tlaib. Since the start of Israel's war in Gaza, she's broken fundraising records, bringing in nearly $3.7 million, mostly from grassroots small and first-time donors. And despite its best efforts, AIPAC hasn't been able to find an opponent to run against her. Tlaib represents one of the largest Arab American communities in the nation, so there's little chance that a pro-Israel candidate could actually take her spot. Outside its PAC, AIPAC continues lobbying for policies favorable to Israel. One of its latest bills was called the Maintaining Our Ironclad Commitment to Israel's Security Act, which sought to ensure a role for Congress in any decision to suspend or delay U.S. arms sales to Israel. Now, a lot of folks are big mad at Biden for his refusal to meaningfully condemn or combat Israel's actions in Gaza. And honestly, fair. The situation is a truly depressing example of politics coming before people, and it is stomach turning to watch our tax dollars go to funding a genocide. But I hope this video has given you some context to see how much bigger this is than the Biden administration or any single president. Looking back on our relationship with Israel, there are multiple points that it feels like a supernatural force intervened, like any time dissent was voiced, a unified shield went up. But that shield is cracking in real time, and we just have to keep up the pressure. Many of our politicians are old as hell and have been drinking Israel's Kool-Aid for decades. Former House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi, former House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer, and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer are among Israel's most powerful and reliable supporters. But the younger, more progressive newcomers should offer some hope. They're less reliant on traditional fundraising structures and are often much more motivated by humanitarian concerns. They won't be silenced as long as they have the grassroots support they need to keep going. And that's where we come in. Check whether any of the squad members are from your state and rally around them. If you care about seeing a shift in U.S. policy away from Israel, we have to make sure that critical voices remain in Congress. Yes, as usual, I'm telling you to vote because not voting or voting third party, at least for president, is not going to change the system. Continuing to show up despite the fuckery and having patience because changing a system takes time is the work that we all need to be doing. Shout 
shout out to my newest supporters as well as supporters in my royal tiers and a very special shout out to my multi-platinum supporters T. Latranger Lucas, Joshua Cole, Thomas Johnson, Sophia Sams, Anthony Giles, Tay, and Brett Piontek. Your generosity makes this channel what it is, so thank you. If you like this video, you might enjoy my video about why conservatives hate George Soros. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.